chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Listener, you're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about ageless allies. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Dirk Stevens is myself, voice talent Paul J. McSorley. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Dirk Stevens and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. No one's too old for an imaginary friend, right? Now, without further ado, I present to you, my friend Kerr. Stepping into the elevator, I press the button for the third floor and turned to watch the door slide closed. Alone. For now. The elevator jerks into motion. I glance down at the Bible and tiny communion set in my hands. The tools of my trade. I've carried them for over 30 years now. They're almost a part of me. My gaze drifts up to the row of numbers above the doors. I've joined dozens of people in marriage, baptized even more, and guided twice that many from the church militant into the church triumphant. My thumbnail digs at the zipper of my Bible case as I watch each number light up in turn, drawing me ever closer to hospice care. To Bob. I close my eyes. Bless me with patience, O Lord, courage and grace, that no matter what comes, whatever sins he means to confess, it will not alter my view of him. The elevator thunks to a stop, breaking my concentration. I finish with a hurried, In Jesus' holy name, amen. The door slides open. Stella, the head nurse on duty tonight, hands one of the other nurses a file and glances up from behind her desk. Hey, Mike. She offers me a tired, sympathetic smirk. The family's here. I nod. I'm glad it's her tonight. Soft-spoken, kind, with a gentle manner that radiates peace. Thanks, Stella. How are they? She rolls her eyes. Well, they ain't killed each other yet. I lean over the counter and give a silent laugh in return. <laughs> you want me to say a prayer for you too? Her lips pull into a deep pucker. If they wake up my ward, it won't be me needing no prayer. Hear what I'm saying? She slaps my hand and her scowl melts to a smile. Go on, I'll be just fine. She tosses a glance down the ward and shivers. I ain't the one you ought to be worrying on. The way they carry it on, it's a wonder he ain't passed already. Just to get some peace. I straighten up. That bad? You'd think that facing death would bring family together. 
that it would make them contemplate their own mortality, spur on feelings of kindness and charity. But no, if anything, it does exactly the opposite. After all this time, it shouldn't surprise me, but it does. In a disappointed way. She squints over the top of her glasses. Mm-hmm. Great. I open my jacket a little just to make sure my clerical collar is clearly visible and slump down the hall toward the place where Armageddon and Doomsday probably had a baby. But I suppose it's to be expected. Two sets of kids from two different marriages, one ending and the other beginning in the same affair. A lot of hurt and jealousy. Add in a sizable inheritance and now a deathbed confession. I take a deep breath and send up another prayer. God, be with me. The hushed bickering of people pretending they don't want to be heard oozes from the room like morning fog. Before I get even halfway to the room, the stench of it fills my nostrils like a rotting corpse. Veiled accusations, poorly concealed insults, and insinuations. The sound of it twists in my gut like a coiling serpent. I push it aside and force my face to adopt the placid, pastor smile I've practiced to perfection over the years. A mask I wear for their benefit. Only when it's firmly in place do I knock on the doorframe and poke my head around the corner. The venomous fog falls silent. Five sets of eyes stare back at me with the same vaguely ashamed, angry, deer-in-the-headlight stare I always get from people who know they're doing wrong. I clear my throat as I step into the doorway, my mask hardening to steel. I hope I'm not interrupting. But it's Bob that answers, the man I came to see, my friend. Hell yes, you're interrupting, he coughs, lifting his head from the pillow. And God bless you. The oldest daughter, Myra, I think, gasps, Daddy? Daddy? The old man almost chokes on the word. Ain't seen a one of you in three years. No letters, no phone calls, and now that I'm dying, it's Daddy? Damned vultures. Get out. All of you. I want to have a private conversation with my friend. But the way he says it, the way he sharpens the word friend like a knife, the way he hurls it like an axe, nearly shatters my reserve. And the effect it has on his children is devastating. One by one, they skulk out the door. Wounded. Limping. I slip off to the side to let them by, trading one pastor mask for another. The warm smile for the wrinkled brow and sad, sympathetic eyes. The one that says, I'll do what I can to make peace. But as the last one leaves and I shut the door behind them, as I turn my attention toward Bob, I remove the mask. But not all the way. Bob's a charter member of my congregation. My friend, but still a sheep under my care. I still can't say how outraged I am at his behavior. Instead, I quietly ask, What was that about? Oh, I know... I'm a right bastard. He waves his hand dismissively. Screw them anyway. That's not why I wanted you here. I pull one of the chairs closer to the bed and sit down. The nurse said you wanted to give a confession. He gives a single curt nod. I lay my communion case down on the food tray, unzip my Bible, and thumb to the verses I had prepared. But we aren't Catholic. Confession is part of absolution, but there are no hard rules. No, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And I've known Bob for decades. There's no way he'd respond to that well anyway. So when I find the verse, rather than read it, I ask, What did you want to talk about? He stares at me for a moment, his gaze shifting between my eyes and the Bible, and I'm struck by how frail he is. How thin! A shadow of the man I met all those years ago when I came to this congregation. Bob was a force of nature, a Vietnam veteran, and proud. 
even when turned 65, his arms were still bigger around than my legs. But it was our initial greeting that I'll never forget. The way he slammed his hand around mine like a vice. The wicked smile spread across his face when he growled, You soft boy. I squeezed back as hard as I could, refusing to let the pain in my hand slip past the mask I wore that day a far less practiced version of the friendly pastor I wore only a moment ago. And it didn't hold. No more than you, Gramps. Bob barked out a laugh and pulled me into a bone-crushing one-armed hug. You'll do fine. Just fine. And that's when it hits me. He was in Vietnam. He received two purple hearts and a medal of valor. My gaze drops to the Bible pressed between my fingertips. I've always known he was a hero, but he's never really talked about it. That must be it. I forget about the verses, close the Bible, and lay it down beside the communion set. He wants to confess something he did during the war. Bob blinks. That's a long story, Mike. I nod. I have all the time you need. But if I'm right, if it is about the war than it was before he came to faith, nearly the same time of the affair. My nose twitches. God, I hope it's not about that. I'm really not interested in hearing the sort of details. His eyes narrow and I can't help but feel like he's sizing me up again, trying to decide if I can be trusted or if I'm worthy. I watch his mask melt, his face go from stoic to a terrified, haunted expression I haven't seen on him before. But it's his words that freeze my blood. Mike, I'm scared. Swallowing, I press my fingertips together and tap them to my chin. Why don't you start at the beginning? After a long moment, Bob nods. All right. He clears his throat and seems to think about where to begin. (sighs) The world was a different place back when I was a kid. Mom didn't work outside the house, and Dad, he shrugs, he showed up in the evening, sat down by the radio to read the paper, and that was it. The only talking we did was when I got in trouble, or if my grades slipped. I nod. I'm almost the same age now that Bob was when we met, but it wasn't much different when I was a kid. Men didn't show emotion except anger. Anything else was weak. Hippie. Their job was to bring home a paycheck and dole out discipline. I don't think I hardly had a decent conversation with my own dad until I left for college. When I became a man. Bob coughs. (laughs) Summer was good. Dad was gone to work and mom spent most of her time with the ladies from church quilting, bridge, whatever. Kids got in the way, and it wasn't just her. It was the same for everyone. School got out, and we were pretty much free to do anything we wanted, as long as we stayed out of Mom's hair. His lips curl into a smile. Me and a few kids from the neighborhood used to hang out in a vacant lot behind the old Ben Franklin's. Sherwood Forest, we called it. Or if it was too hot, we'd head down to the creek, go skinny dipping, catch crayfish, or just skip rocks until supper. His head falls back to the pillow. Life was good. Leaning back in my chair, I nod. It was simpler. His eyes shake off their far-off cast and focus on me. I shrug. I had television, but no internet. It wasn't your world but certainly not like anything the kids today have. Things were simpler. No. His gaze drifts off to the far wall. Not simpler. Different. His response catches me off guard, but judging by his face, he's lost in memory. I don't interrupt. It was early August, he drones, more to himself than me. School was a few weeks off yet, but we played out our usual haunts and itching for something new. Graham said the junk dealer passed, 
which meant he wasn't around to chase us out of his lot no more. Bob snorts out a laugh. <laughs> so, of course, that's where we ended up. It was a great place. Busted up cars, old refrigerators, broken glass. Everything a kid's not supposed to go near. Mountains of it. The stink was unbelievable. But to a bunch of bored nine-year-olds, it was like finding El Dorado. Billy spotted a couple of busted mop handles. He tossed one to Graham, and before long, I was standing in the back of a wrecked Model T truck with a hubcap tied to the top of my head, helping Tommy defend our castle from invaders. Bob flashes me an impish smirk. We were doing a good job of it, too. I imagine the scene. Four little boys in junk armor beating each other with sticks. A smile worms across my lips. It is so similar to my own childhood, except we had a tree fort. And I only had one invader, who I was constantly fighting to keep out. My little sister. And not with sticks. With cunning. Bribery. Anything I could think of. But then Graham landed a hit on Tommy's shoulder. Bob waves his arm, pulling me back to the here and now. Tommy shouted, The wall is lost! Exactly like the sheriff of Nottingham did the night before on the radio. And so we had to retreat. Because that's what they did. I looked around, but with Graham climbing up one side and Billy on the other, there was only one place to go. Through the truck's back window. It worked. The window was already gone, and last night the sheriff only got away by sneaking through a trap door. I screamed, This way! The secret tunnel! Kicked a few shards of glass out of the way and squirmed into the cab head first. Behind, Graham yelled, Ha ha, John! Look at the cowards run! Doing his best to sound like Robin Hood. Graham scrambled up and over the back of the truck just as Billy got his leg on the edge of the bed. Tommy dove through the window like a dog through a hoop, but Graham was already hot on his heels. I barely got out of the way before Tommy hit the seat and rolled down onto the floor. Graham stuck his arm in and swung. His mop handle caught the edge of my helmet. The clang rattled my cage, but he was aiming for Tommy so I rolled down under the steering wheel to get out of the way. But one of the pedals got caught up on my shirt. I looked over at Tommy to see if he could help me get untangled. He sat curled up on the floor, out of Graham's reach, with some old frying pan that must have been on the floor held up over his face like a shield. But... Bob's voice trailed away. Before I could get his attention, everything went cold but I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean cold? I mean cold, Bob snarls. One second it was hotter than the devil's balls out, and the next my nose hairs froze stiff as icicles. I watched Tommy's breath curl around the edge of his shield like smoke, all shivers and goosebumps. And it wasn't just me either. Graham saw it too. Goosebumps shot up his arms like lightning all the way to the sleeves of his t-shirt. He stopped swinging, blew out a long puff of steam, and we just sort of sat there shivering, watching as it swirled along the roof of the cab and stuck to the windshield in a thick layer of frost. Tommy lowered his shield. Graham mumbled something like, What the hell? And just like that? It was hot again. Bob stares at me, I assume waiting for a comment. But I'm not sure what to say. I open my mouth, but before I make a sound, Bob interrupts. That's when he came. I study his face, waiting for him to explain, but instead his gaze drifts to the door, his expression vacant. I clear my throat, but I'm losing him. To the memory or what, I'm not sure, but I need to keep him here. Talking, I lean forward. He who? Bob's focus jerks back to me. Kerr. Kerr? Bob nods. It wasn't natural, that cold, and it flat rattled me. 
I barely got my hands to stop shaking enough to grab the handle and force the door open. I was in such a damned hurry to get out, I forgot all about being caught. I dove for the exit. My shirt didn't, and I could have sworn the devil himself had a hold on me. I jerked as hard as I could. My shirt ripped. I tumbled out, flat on my face, and tore off on my hands and knees like my britches were on fire. I jumped over an old fridge and... Bob snorts. <laughs> slammed into some skinny kid I didn't even know was there. Kerr, I'm guessing? Bob nods. Looks to be about three years younger than me, a head shorter and pale, like he never saw the sun in his life. None of us ever saw him before, so we figured he had to be new and shy, seeing as he was spying on us like that. But I hit him like a freight train, knocked him flat on his ass, hard enough to sock the breath out of me. But Kerr? Nah. He sat up, grabbed his hat, and jumped to his feet like nothing had happened. He just sort of stared at me for a second with this strange look on his face, like he knew me then flopped his hat on top of his head and offered me a hand up. Bob shakes his head. But the way he was dressed was like something out of Grandma's photo album. Brown driver's cap, long wool shorts, argyle socks and suspenders, a white button-up shirt, and the way he talked. Bob's voice takes on a sophisticated tone. Never. Have I seen anyone run so very quickly, Master? Um, pardon, but I don't believe I've had the privilege. His voice goes back to normal. He was six, Mike. Now what the hell kind of six-year-old kid talks like that? An educated kid, I suppose. Maybe from Boston. But I don't answer. I can tell by his voice. He's not asking. He's making a point. Bob scratches his chin. But him being there, being so strange, and us being kids, we forgot all about the cold. He didn't seem hurt, so we asked him who he was, where he was from, and before long we went back to screwing around. Kerr suggested hide-and-seek. Since he was the new kid, nobody objected. I agreed to be it, and everyone ran off to hide. It wasn't easy. There were hundreds of good hiding spots in that junkyard. I tagged Billy. Tommy made it to base. But Graham? His face takes on a haunted look. The police found him later. Still in his hiding spot. Trapped inside that old bridge. Dead. My eyes shut tight on their own. So that's it. That's what he wanted to confess. His friend died, and he blames himself. Even after all these years. It wasn't your fault, Bob. He winces, but not in pain. Something closer to irritation. You're missing the point. I never did find Kerr. No one did. He was just... gone. What do you mean, gone? Bob sits up sending himself into a coughing fit. I reach for the button to signal the nurse, but he swats my hand down. The fit passes and he flops back to the bed, panting. I... I mean... Gone. Gone. Nobody ever even heard of him. Not the police. Not any of the parents. Not even of a kid matching his description. It was like he never existed at all. So he was visiting family or something. But I think I see what's happening here. Bob's never been one to talk about his feelings. We've just touched on a major traumatic event from his childhood, one I'm fairly certain is why he wanted a confession and now he's uncomfortable talking about it. So he's focused on Kerr. It's avoidance, plain and simple. I'm just about to steer him back to Graham and how his death affected him when Bob cuts me off with a snort. Or something. He grunts and rolls his head to look me in the eye. Oh, Kerr didn't stay missing forever. 
I bumped into him a few years later, about the time Billy's family moved away. I leaned forward, intrigued. Usually when Bob doesn't want to talk about something, he runs down a rabbit hole. Random branching tangents. But this? This seems different somehow. I make a mental note to come back to Graham's death and motion for him to continue. I was 17. Diane and I had already been dating about a year. But Tommy? Bob heaves out a single laugh. Ha! He had had a thing for this hot little redhead, Eunice, ever since they were freshmen. But it took him three years to work up the courage to finally ask her out. Only problem was, his old man wouldn't let him borrow the car. So we went double. I picked him up and we all went down to the Tasty Freeze. Diane and me in the front seat, Tommy and Eunice in the back. Bob's eyes narrow. I ordered a chili dog, took my first bite... And just like before, everything went cold. The windows fogged over and everything. Well, the windshield anyway. It was July. Hot, even at night. And we had the windows down. It bit hard, but only for a second. I swallowed the bite in my mouth, and it was hot again. I wasn't even 100% sure I hadn't imagined it. But then I caught something move out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head to see what it was. And there he was. Kerr, standing by the corner of the building, just like I remembered him. Tweed driving cap, argyle socks, wool breeches and all. His brow peaked in a questioning, desperate plea. He didn't age. The tone of his voice pulls me up straight. What? He was the same pale, skinny six-year-old kid from years before. I swear he didn't age a day. Not a single day. Bob's chin shook. I look back at Tommy, you know, just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. But the look on his face, his eyes told me I wasn't. I glanced back at Kerr. He waved, came trotting over like he didn't have a care in the world, stopped short just off the front fender, and blew a long, low whistle. <whistles> That's a right fine machine you have there. He drug his hand along the fender as he came closer, transfixed by my dad's olds. What a magnificent automobile. Diane tugged at my shoulder. Do you know that boy? No. Shook my head. I really don't think I do. Never taking my eyes off Kerr, I handed her my chili dog and climbed out of the car. Who are you? What do you want? I just want to mate, you know? A friend. Kerr tipped his head to the side and smiled. I see you've got a fair few. But it wasn't a friendly smile, more the way a cat smiles at a canary. And not at me, at Diane. Would you be my friend? I don't know what it was, but those five words, softly spoken, dropped a block of solid ice in my chest. Diane shrugged. Sure. Her gaze lingered on his cap, her lips curled into a slight smirk. My grandpa has a hat like that. Ice spreading through my veins. I watched her take another bite, ease the doors closed, and step between Kerr and the car. Between Kerr and Diane. His voice. The cold. The fact that he hadn't aged. That he was here at all. All of it was just nine kinds of wrong. I needed to stop it. To get him to leave. No, Kerr. She doesn't want to be your friend. Bob, Diane gasped. Don't be so rude. But her next breath came as a coughing gag. My head jerked around. She sucked in a single rasping gasp. Her eyes went wide and the chili dog slipped from her fingers. 
I tore the door open and dove past the steering wheel, but she was already turning blue. I grabbed her by the arm and spun her around, but she was so scared she fought back, biting, punching, clawing. I couldn't get a hold of her. Not until she went limp. Tears shine in Bob's eyes. She never moved again. My chest aches. Bob, I'm sorry. I had no idea. But I can't make sense of what he's telling me. That cur was some kind of ghost? He knows better. The Catholics may believe in purgatory, that the souls of the dead linger on in the world of the living, paying their penance. But he's Lutheran. Jesus paid for our sins in full. It is finished. There is nothing more to be done. Today you will be with me in paradise. Not after 10,000 years in purgatory. Today, there are no such things as ghosts. The spirit moves on to either heaven or hell at the moment of death. There is no third option. Bob knows this. He's messing with me. He has to be. But as I take in his dark sunken eyes, the deep wrinkles framing his mouth, there's no hint of a smile, no twinkle in his eye, nothing to suggest he's joking. And he certainly doesn't sound senile. What are you saying? Bob's gaze stays locked on mine, as if he didn't hear me. Grr, he snorts. It was like he was never there at all. Just gone. Again. Like a puff of smoke. His jaw stiffens, and for a moment, the marine I know appears in the shadows of his face. Until Nam. I don't blink. I hardly dare to breathe. You saw Kerr in Vietnam? Bob nods. You never serve, even if you had, unless you were there. You can't even imagine. There were no roads, no jeeps, just hills and jungle. Blackhawks took you where you needed to go, and then it was all on foot. Single file through brush so thick you couldn't hardly see the man in front of you. Where there were trails, like as not, they were booby trap. Trip wires, deadfalls, mines. And that's if you weren't ambushed, which felt like every other patrol. Gentlemen, he snorts in a low mocking tone. You will ride into battle, and this will be your horse. His voice shifts back to normal. That's what Sarge told us in basic. He made it sound so noble, too. Like we were knights. Like riding a Blackhawk was some kind of honor. Truth is, they were sitting ducks in the air, and so damned big and loud the enemy knew we were there long before we landed. We were always in the crosshairs. I nod. He's not the first soldier I've counseled, not even from Vietnam. But he's right. I never serve. I can't relate. I can only imagine. And from what I've come to understand, he's right again. All wars are hell. But Vietnam made Iraq, Afghanistan, and all the wars that followed look easy by comparison. But the war itself was only part of the burden. The death toll was worse in other conflicts, but Vietnam was the first war to play out on television. The killing was virtually live-streamed by embedded reporters serving with the troops, right into the peaceful lives of everyday America. It was the difference between going to the store to buy ground beef and the farmer's perspective, raising, killing, and butchering the cow yourself. Theory and experience. And the public wasn't ready. Unlike those who served in other wars, they weren't seen as heroes. They were rapists, baby killers. When they came home from Nam, there was no parade, no support, only shame. And by and large, they were drafted. They had no choice but to go. Bob's eyes glass over. I can tell by the way his brow twitches that he's drifting. 
losing himself to the memory again. I can't help but wonder what I could have done to help ease his burden if we had talked about this earlier. If Kerr isn't some psychosis brought on by trauma. That if I'd been a better pastor, a better friend, if Kerr would even exist in his mind. How badly I've failed him. We've been taking sporadic fire in camp, Bob hisses, pulling me from my thoughts. Nothing heavy, just random small arms fire. Probably just one guy, but it needed taken care of. Orders were to go dark, seek, and destroy. We left at 1800 hours, well after dark. Five of us. I was on point. It was Chaz and Reefer's first time out, so I put Lex, our tracker, on my six, and Snake took rear guard. He snorts out a laugh. <laughs> you should have seen Chaz's face when we left the trail. His voice changes into a frightened, quivering whisper. S Sarge? Shut it, Chaz. Bob's eyes narrow. His voice lowers to a growl, lost in a conversation he had ages ago. One word at the wrong time and we're all dead. You don't talk unless I say. You don't breathe unless I say. Got it? He swallows. Eyes wide. Yes, sir. Bob blinks. He glances around the room for a moment, then seems to remember where he is. You ever been in the jungle at night? No, I haven't. But now I'm not sure if he's here. If it's me he's talking to. If he even knows who I am. The bugs and frogs are deafening. The air is so thick it's almost like swimming. It took hours, but eventually we got up the first ridge. Roughly the same spot the colonel thought the sniper hit us from yesterday. Snake found what he thought was a sniper's nest at the edge of a cliff overlooking the valley. Bob waves his hand as if shooing off a fly. A nest is what we called the spot where a sniper dug in to wait for a good shot. But, judging by the way the plants were springing back up in this one, he had moved on a while ago. Typical. A stationary sniper is a dead sniper. Shoot once and move on. More than that, and the enemy can get a fix on your position. Bob's gaze flicks to the door. Lex. He jerks his head toward my feet, as if motioning for someone to take a look at my shoes. His eyes track whatever memory he's reliving walks over and crouches down. What do you make of this? I sit motionless, watching as his eyes narrow and flick around the room, listening to comrades only he can hear, doing my best to hide the pinpricks clawing at my back. It's like he's caught between two worlds, drifting between the past and present. I'm not sure if I should interrupt, if I should try and bring him back to the here and now, or let it play out. Six hours. Bob mumbles under his breath, as if thinking. His voice raises to a whisper. Which way did he go? He glances over at the far wall and his brow knots into a question mark. How many? He nods, lost in a conversation he had ages ago, weighing whatever information, I'm guessing, Lex told him back then. His gaze darts to the empty chair beside mine. Chaz, I want you and... A shiver rakes through his body and he falls silent. He takes a deep breath, blows, and his eyes go wide. No... He blinks at the walls, the IV sticking to his arm, and finally his gaze settles on me. Mike. He licks his lips and the air of confusion seems to lift from his face. Vietnam in the summer is like being in a pressure cooker. But there I was, soaked clean through with sweat. And then, freezing cold. Just like before. I lean forward. Kerr? Bob nods. You got it. Just like the junkyard. Like the tasty breeze. I knew he was coming. And I knew what it meant. That someone was going to die. Just like before. I wasn't about to let that happen. I signaled for Lex to take point and head west. Then eased on back to Snake. 
and told him I wanted to hold back and play drag for a spell. I watched Snake's pack vanish into the underbrush, unhooked my canteen, and took a swig, probing every dark pocket I could see for movement. But this time, Kerr didn't walk in. The darkness sort of crumpled like a piece of paper. And there he was. Same clothes, same hat, same age, same every damned thing. Bob's eyes glass over. Oh, you're playing soldiers? That's capital. Can I play too? He answers his own question, but in a deeper, more Bob-like tone. Sure, you can be lookout. Jolly good. Bob squeaks. Where shall I take up watch, Capitan? He nods off to the side. Over there, Private, at the edge of the cliff. His chin trembles. Best vantage point. Oh, yes, quite so. Why, I can see the whole valley from here. Say, what am I looking for? Bandits? Brigands? Shh. Bob presses his finger to his lips. Stealth attack. We have to look carefully. His eyes go wide. Oh, I see. Yes, quite. He ducks his head a little and squints hard. Terribly dark. But no worries. They shan't get by me, sir. Good lad. Bob's chin trembles. He closes his eyes and turns away, sobbing. You killed him? The words drip from my lips as soon as the realization hits. Barely a breath, but they snap Bob back to reality like a thunderclap. No. But, I start, but Bob cuts me off with a coughing growl. I led him to the edge of the cliff. I pushed him over. I watched his body tumble down the rock face and disappear into the jungle below. But I didn't stick around. He was dead. I was sure of it, and I had a mission to complete. As soon as he was gone, I tightened the straps on my pack and humped off double time to find the others. Bastard didn't even scream. I wince, struggling to make sense of what I'm hearing. You pushed a six-year-old boy off a cliff and just... I can't even finish the sentence. I know Kerr isn't real. I don't know if he's a psychological manifestation a coping mechanism, or what. But I do know he has something to do with what Bob's trying to confess. And the symbolism isn't good. Kerr is tied to two very traumatic deaths in Bob's past and a time of his life he's kept secret through all the years I've known him. When he killed Kerr. I rub my temples, trying to recall anything from my psychology classes that could help. But I'm drawing a blank. All I can do at this point is to let him get it out. Then help him find peace. So I follow the only path I can make sense of. Did you get the sniper? Bob rolls his eyes. Yeah. Lex tracked him right to his new nest. Snuck up and slit his throat with his eyes still pressed to the scope to hear Lex tell it. They were on their way back when I caught up. No muss, no fuss. We even made it back to camp before sunup. The colonel gave us the rest of the day as a reward for a job well done. He swallows and his face takes on the haunted expression he had when he first started talking. But I didn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I could hear him, Kerr, crying inside my head. Please help me. I'm scared, Bob. The jaguars are coming. Don't leave me. I don't want to die takes a deep, shuddering breath and fixes me with his stare. I couldn't take it, Mike. Snuck out of camp and whacked my way over to the bottom of the cliff where I saw Kerr's body crash through the canopy. I stop rubbing and stare at him. You mean, you found his body? I found an old tattered driving cap, some rotten cloth, old dried up bones, half turned to powder, a cracked skull. He tugs at the edge of his blanket. I don't know what I found, but a few nights ago, I heard him calling to me. Inside my head, just like before, after I pushed him off that cliff. But quieter, further away. 
The next night, he sounded closer, louder. Come play with me. His hands tremble as he twists the edge of his blanket. He's been getting closer every night. Last night, I swear he was right outside the door. That's why I called you, Mike. He hasn't forgotten what I did to him. That's why he's been drawing it out, to torture me. But he's coming for me. Tonight. I don't have anywhere I can run. I reach out and take his hand to comfort him, but his words echo in my ears. I don't have anywhere to run. Almost the exact same words his wife, Mei Ling, said to me ages ago when their marriage was in turmoil. He blamed me for trouble between he and children. I still remember the look on her face, the way she dabbed the corner of her eye with her handkerchief, the way she refused to look me in the eye, how her shoulders shook when she whispered, he write in English, the language she learned only after moving to America by watching soap operas. I knew he was married. I knew it was a wrong, she managed. But it was fate. I was uh, badly hurt by artillery strike on village. Everyone run. They thought I was dead. I lay in broken house for two days. I could not move. So much blood. Bob, find me. He tie cloth around me. He carried to next village miles away. He come back many times to make sure I okay. She took the handkerchief in both hands. He saved my life. He give me reason to live. I love him always. But he break faith with wife. Children blame me. Wife blame me. They talk bad to him about me. She raised her eyes to meet my gaze for a millisecond before going back to her handkerchief. What if he listen? What if he no want me now? I have no family in old country. All dead. No family here. Only Bob. Almost unconsciously, she cupped the side of her swollen belly. I have nowhere to go. Mei Ling. I pat Bob's hand as the memory fades. I know what's haunting him now. Guilt. A series of short clipped whispers pull my attention to the gap under the door and a knot squirms to life somewhere deep inside my chest. So much venom, so much hate. And it's my doing. Mei Ling was the one who came to me. She wasn't Christian at the time and Bob's first wife was less concerned with love than judgment. In her view, Mei Ling wasn't Christian, and therefore Bob wasn't bound to her in the eyes of God. That every moment he spent with her was compounding his adultery. Between her constant barrage, the kids pleading, and the pastor of her new church piling on, he was nearly convinced that the only right thing to do would be to divorce Mei Ling and go back to his first wife. That marriage was a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman, and any subsequent marriage was invalid. And to a point, I couldn't disagree. The Bible is pretty black and white on marriage. One man, one woman, joined in a single lifelong union. But Bob had already stepped across that line. His former wife had moved in with her sister. She had a job and a support network. Mei Ling was eight months pregnant. A foreigner with no family, no support, and she barely spoke English. So I told him that, yes, what he did was wrong. He had betrayed his oath, his wife, and his children, but that if he left Mei Ling, he wouldn't be undoing that mistake. He would be repeating it. That his duty now was to the woman with the greatest need, to Mei Ling. A series of clipped half-whispers rattled through the gap under the door like bullets from a machine gun. At Stella's stern, quiet voice, they fall silent, but just the scent of turmoil they carry with them ricochets through my very soul. My shoulders slump. I did this. I should have made it clear that he had two families, that his responsibilities weren't to Mei Ling alone. But I didn't. At the time, all I could see was her position. I was aghast at the words of my fellow pastor, 
blinded by my own outrage at the insensitivity, the hate, and I failed in my responsibilities as a shepherd of God's people. All the strife between his children, all the anger and jealousy, was my doing. Pressure builds behind my eyes. I hide it with my mask, but I know who Kerr is. Guilt. Repressed guilt given substance by shame and unresolved pain, but only in his mind. A reoccurring phantom that crops up whenever his conscience prods him. For the game that claimed his friend's life when he was a child. Diane's death because he couldn't save her. And the death that came at his own hands. That of his marriage. My arm moves like lead as I reach for my Bible, but at last, I know what I have to do. There's no point in explaining all this to him. To Bob, Kerr is real. Some ghost or demon that's haunted him all his life. And in a way, I suppose he's right. But not in the way he thinks. It would be easier if that were how Satan worked. But no, he's far too clever for that. The demons he sends are of a different sort. They hide in the shadows of the mind. Lust, greed, pride. And the wounds they inflict are far more deadly than any poison. Guilt, shame, hate. Infections that twist the soul. And it's his soul I need to heal. If I try to explain, I'll simply touch his defenses. Nothing I say will reach him. And so... Opening my Bible, I find a passage I can use to cover both the metaphor and the demon. Clear my throat and read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. I glance up at Bob watching me in silence. Whatever creature this cur is, he is subject to Christ, along with every other being under heaven. Through him, you are a child of the Most High. Kerr has no power over you. I tap my finger against the page. You don't need to be afraid, Bob. The victory is already won. All Kerr can do is try to scare you. Nothing else. It was God that decided Graham and Diane's time, not Kerr. Remember? Not even a sparrow falls from the sky apart from the will of God. For a moment, Bob doesn't react. Then he nods and settles back into his pillow. I lay my Bible back on the food tray and pull his blanket up over his shoulders. Together we speak the Lord's Prayer. I give him communion announce the forgiveness he has through Christ Jesus' atoning sacrifice and the victory proclaimed by his resurrection. Bob's face softens. His eyelids droop. This is what I live for. Giving comfort. Peace. Smiling, I pat his hand and tell him I'll be back to check on him in the morning. He nods, weary from the exhaustion of relief. I tuck the cup and silver tray back into my communion set, collect my Bible, and turn for the door. He whispers his thanks. I wish him pleasant dreams, push down the handle on the door, and force my face into a new mask. The placid pastor. The face I'll need when I step out into the hall to deal with the mess I caused. Bob's broken family. The door swings open with a soft rumble of the hinge the only sound beyond Bob's heart monitor. I glance down the hall, but other than a cart along the wall a few doors down, the ward seems empty. I ease the door closed as quietly as I can and glance down at my watch. Half past midnight. I was in there for two hours. His family must have gone for the night. I let my hand fall to my side and make my way to the nurse's station. Seeing as she's alone, I lean down on my elbows and watch Stella type away on the keyboard. You run them off? Only as far as the cafeteria. Stella peers up at me over her glasses and flashes a tired-looking smirk. You were in there a long time, Mike. Figured you needed a rest between bouts. I can't help but smile. She's one in a million. 
all heart. I hold out my hand. She lays her palm in mine, and I give it a squeeze. Thanks. Her cheeks flush. She slips her hand from my grasp and goes back to typing. Just like that, the moment's gone. I straighten up with a groan. Oh, I suppose I'd best head down to the cafeteria then. You want anything? Nope, I'm good. With a nod, I slump off toward the elevator. All right, see you in a few. I hit the call button. A few moments pass and the door slides open. Behind me, the clicking of Stella's typing falls quiet. Mike? Her voice pulls me to a stop. Yeah? She stands up just enough so I can see her face over the top of the counter. You don't hear this near enough, but thank you. For everything you do, I know folks don't appreciate it like they should, but I want you to know I see you. My eyes burn, but before I can say anything, she clears her throat and flops down out of sight. Now, get. Stella. A shiver shakes through me as I step onto the elevator. God bless her. Turning, I stretch out my hand and press the button for the third floor. If only everyone saw people the way she did. The doors rattle closed. I sigh, toss one last glance down the hallway before they slide together. And that's when I see him, through the smoke, like curl of my breath, a little boy in a tweed driving cap standing outside Bob's door. He sees me watching, lifts his head, and smiles. Goosebumps prickle down my arms. Kerr, I take in his tan breeches, argyle socks and suspenders and my mind goes numb i can't move it can't be the doors clunk shut shaking my mind back to life he's not a psychological manifestation kerr's real i saw him which means bob was right about everything the elevator lurches i slam my palm against the open button but I'm too late. Panting, I glance up at the numbers above the door, but I know how this works. I have to ride down to the third floor before I can come back up. I can't wait that long. The light for the next floor down blinks to life, and one word presses into my mind. Stairs. I hammer the button over and over until the door cracks open and bolt for the stairwell. I take them three at a time, hit the door like a linebacker, and it slams open. Stella and three other nurses gape at me as I bolt past. They shout something, but I'm already at Bob's room. The doors open, I round the corner, and freeze, still as stone. Kerr's there, standing beside the bed. He glances up at me as I skid to a stop, pale as a sheet. But it's not that, or the dark circles under his eyes that sucks the breath from my lungs. It's not even the chilling aura he seems to radiate that sends my heart racing. It's the other boy that does that. The partially transparent one he's talking to. The slightly older boy with Bob's eyes. The one sitting on the bed. Rising out of the middle of Bob's chest. Pasta? Kurt takes his hat between his hands, looking a little embarrassed. But even so, I can barely tear my eyes away from the boy in the bed. Pardon my incredulity but I'm afraid you've caught me at a... He seems to search for the right word. Rather awkward moment. If you'll excuse me. He glances back at the ghostly figure sitting in Bob's chest, nods, and the boy vanishes. Now then. Kerr flops the cap back on his head. I expect explanations are in order. I... I... I stutter, but my mind checked out the second I entered the room. I can't stop staring at Bob's chest where the boy was sitting, like a kid in a Bob bathtub. For some reason, my gaze jumps to the heart monitor, to the blank screen, the single green pixel glowing near the bottom. Kerr follows my stare. Oh, right. Might as well start there, then. Time's stopped for the now. 
but the way he says it sends my fingernails digging into my palms, as if it's nothing. Took the dog for a walk and stopped time for a bit after getting the paper. He turns his head back toward me, flashes a slight smirk and shrugs. Like I said, awkward moment. I always arrange for a bit of privacy, but when Bobby told me about your little chat, I thought I'd make an exception in your case. We weren't meant to meet for a good while yet, but anyway, introductions. He thrusts out his thin, pale hand. Asriel, angel of the harvest, at your service. But you can call me Kerr. When I don't move, he reaches down and takes my hand in his. His cold, bony fingers clasp around my palm. A creeping cold radiates down my arm, and his smile widens. No need to speak. I know all about you. Your Reverend Michael Harris Brown, you are? He releases my hand, and I feel compelled to wipe it clean on my pants. He watches me do this, and his smile fades. Oh, there's no need to be like that. You and I are comrades, we are. Both serve the same master. Though, he huffs out a long, hollow sigh. It is lonely work, isn't it? He tosses a glance back at Bob, lying motionless on the bed. I thought he and I could be friends, but... He shrugs. Work got in the way. I watch him wipe his nose down the back of his hand, and somewhere, deep behind the shock and horror, a small piece of me can't help but feel sorry for him. I know exactly what he's talking about. Bob's been my friend for ages, but even with him I can only ever be so close. I'm always a pastor. I can never lower the mask completely. Never be human. Work does that. Kerr nods. Well, after everything Bobby told you, I just wanted you to know I didn't cause anything. I never do. It was just their time, and I was there to take them home. I don't know what came over me. He scratches the back of his head, and for a moment, he looks like a lost, confused child. I suppose I just didn't want to feel so alone. Just once. Just to feel what it was like to have a friend. Just for a while. His lips pull into a shy smirk. Death wants a friend. Silly, huh? Asriel. Death. Kerr. I glance over at Bob again, finally realizing what just happened. What I witnessed. That Bob has moved on. Not so silly. I croak, not even fully aware of what I'm saying. Kerr's dark eyes brighten under the brim of his cap. Truly? I nod, but my mouth is moving on its own. I can't stop thinking about Bob. If that boy sitting in his chest was his soul, what actually just happened? Truly, I mumble. But if Kerr is who he says he is, what happens? Kerr silences me with a finger to his lips. No... That one's a leap of faith. He glances back over his shoulder, as if listening to a distant call, then tips his hat. Work beckons, but just so you don't get the wrong idea, I'll pop in at your place this Saturday evening. We can grab a pizza if you like. Maybe a film? Friend? He catches me staring at Bob and winces. Oh, sorry. I guess... I don't have the same perspective as you lot. Too soon? No, it's fine. I'll miss him. But he's gone to a better place. I I Kerr, hoping for some affirmation, but instead he only vanishes. Warmth floods the air, the heart monitor sounds out a long lingering tone, and Stella bursts through the doorway behind me, two other nurses at her heels. She pauses just long enough to toss me a confused glance, then hurries to Bob's side. I don't wait for them to finish examining him before stepping out into the hall to wait. I already know he's gone. What I don't know is what comes next. Next. 
I hope you enjoyed My Friend Kerr, as written by Dirk Stevens and performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. Dirk Stevens is a figment of your imagination, more at home wandering the dreams and fantasies of men than the mundane lands of the real. He serves as an intermediary only, writing the stories of those whose consciousnesses allows him entrance. He's an award-winning member of the Springfield Writers Guild. If you enjoyed tonight's tale, check the Fear from the Heartland archives to pull up one or all of the other dozen or so stories by Dirk Stevens. You can find more of me, Paul J. McSorley, right here on our own very network, as well as over on Audible at paulsbooks.net. And be sure to check out Fear from the Heartland, which has over 120 episodes for you to love and enjoy. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week, when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>